Hey out there Akronites, welcome once again to Around Akron with Blue Green. On this episode, I'm gonna visit a theater in Barberton. I'm gonna talk to a 3D printing artist. I'm gonna sit down with an ambassador from Akron and I'm gonna tell you the story of a kid from Akron who started the city of Barberton. All of this and much more on Around Akron with Blue Green. Now to kick this show off, I'm gonna head over to the west side of Barberton and sit down with the West Theater owners and operators and see what this place is all about. The history of this theater that I know is that it was built uh, in 1945. It was start, the plans were started. It was opened in uh, 1947 and it was built by the Slovaks, the Slovene Picture Corporation owned it and at the time it was a uh, it was a great idea because movies were very popular and uh, it seated 700 people at that time. It um, however struggled because TV was coming out and through the 50s TV basically took over a lot of the movie industry and a lot of the movie theaters uh, basically had to either shut down or move into multiplex theaters to try to keep it alive. There was two simplex projectors, 32 millimeter. Um, there was still the original mono-tubed uh, amplifier. It was actually bi-amped, had a special horn speaker behind me. RCA equipment, was all the sound equipment was RCA. Um, a lot of it was intact and actually running. There were no films here. A lot of people ask if there was movies here. The movies get returned. As soon as the movie is done, they are sent back and destroyed. Same with the posters. People ask about the posters. They are to be destroyed. So that kind of things that weren't here, but the, I knew the projectors worked, the lamps worked. There are 3000 watt arc lamps. Um, yes, it was all there, but I knew there was no fu future in uh, film. I already knew that. It would either be go digital or move on and do something else. We had some grandparents who came for the Polar Express and they had brought their, uh, their grandkids. They had actually met here at the theater. The grandfather was an usher and the grandmother worked at here, like here in concession, and that's how they met. <laughs> and they brought their grandchild to come see the Polar Express uh, this past Christmas. When people come in here and they see that it's, it's like what it was, it's not drastically changed, it's not changed into a multiplex theater. Uh, the seats have not been replaced, or the original seats, I repaired the seats rather than replaced them. Uh, I'm a very handy person, so uh, when I have people help me, I, that's, that's the whole thing. Let's, let's maintain as much as possible, and that nostalgia aspect is very important um, because the people's memories, uh, they basically mostly go from the, the 50s through till about the 70s. It was showing movies quite a bit. It, it really slowed down through the 80s and then it, it got rented to a church, the Movement Church. So we're trying to keep it cost effective for the public as well as bring them something they want, things that people want. Like we did comedy back in November you know, it, it did okay. And we're just going to keep pushing on and finding what people want, and that's what we're going to do. Movies, they don't like so well, unless we do something with the movie. Like Peter Rabbit was great when we did the Easter egg hunt and then showed Peter Rabbit after the egg hunt, then that draws the people in. The egg hunt draws them in. Right now my menu is hamburgers, hot dogs, you know, mozzarella sticks, onion rings, those kind of things. Um, I'm really looking forward to be able to do full dinners. Like we'd want to be able to do a set down steak dinner, a salad bar. So we want to try to hit what all the crowds like. So, you know, some people are great with buffets, but other people would rather sit down and somebody serve them.
West Theater is also the only place in and around Akron that hosts the Rocky Horror Picture Show. And I used to come to Rocky Horror 20 years ago <laughs> when, <laughs> and know just about everyone that is on cast has been on cast or is on cast now. Uh, it's kind of fun to have that kind of history with everybody and just to keep something alive and keep something going, a cult classic going like that. I started to see that there was a lot of interest in this building and I, um, I, that's what pushed me to go ahead and start fixing this because people would come in uh, to rent my storage units and to rent my U-Haul trucks and to do things and they just said, I remember coming here, man, I'd love to come here again or can you take me upstairs, can you show me the place? Um, this building has a lot of fond memories with me. Um, so it was, it was quite something to me and I'm not born in Barberton, so uh, originally was from Toronto, Canada. So it was quite, uh, it, it's all the people that basically pushed me to do it just because of all the fond memories and I thought maybe we could do something with this. Next up, I'm gonna head over to Portage Lakes and talk with Angry Bob about his 3D printing process. Let's go see what Angry Bob is all about. I try to make the image look like it's actually trying to free itself from the paper. So it's actually like breathing life into that image. Uh, it literally looks like it's coming to life. <laughs> Especially some of the ones that are demons or, <laughs> there's a couple of them that I get a little bit nervous when I'm doing them because it's like, ooh, this looks too real. It's hard to describe it, no one does it. I mean, I, <laughs> I do three-dimensional paper bending. And they look at me and go, huh? And it's like, go to plart.net and you'll understand. You won't see it that well, but at least you'll have an idea. And then that's when I started shooting little TikTok videos to show 15 seconds of the depth and I go back and forth to show that, oh my, it does really come off the page. It, it's not like, well, does it? <laughs> It's hard, it's hard to shoot. Or I should say it's hard to produce a piece and sell it in three dimension when everything that you try to sell it in is in a two dimensional world. You don't see the shadows, you don't see the actual image till it, you're looking at it in life. Yeah, sure, that was my first one. Did it in foam core, and then that was one. I was still new in printing, so trying to get work anywhere, and then the printing started going. And then I just became a forms house, basically. I print three, three part, four part forms. And I uh, kind of got sidelined, I should say. Got away from the, the artwork and kind of missed it. <laughs> When it comes to uh, the three-dimensional custom pieces, it's kind of like taking your favorite photo. The reason you like that photo, there's usually a good reason you like it. It's taken at what I like to call the comic angle, meaning it's taken in a position that you see the three-dimensional depth in the two-dimensional image. And, and when you can see that, that's when I can 3D it. If you take a photograph, like you know, a lot of people do their babies, and they go, well, why can't I have my baby? And I try to explain to them, well, if the baby's with a rattle, if the baby's with a blanket, and the baby's you know, interacting with objects, I got no problem. But if you take it straight away on the face, it's a box. I can't, can't 3D a box. So I had so much trouble <laughs> of doing custom pieces for cars, kids, cats, all of it that I ended up going into a cosplay. And cosplay, basically, they dress up as Spider-Man, and the minute you put a camera in front of them, they're Spider-Man. And the minute they do that, they're Thor, they're whoever. 
I can't, there's not a photo I can't do. Currently, I have about 450 pieces of art on there, and I go through the spectrum. I mean, it can be comics, it can be Victorian, it can actually be master artworks from 16th century, 15, it can be anything. But there's 450 pieces that just tickle me to death, and I brought them out. Usually what I do is I have a Pinterest page that I have like 42,000 people a month look at it. And I take what they like, and then I sort out the ones they pick, and then I produce that artwork. And no one knows that they're actually the ones that are choosing the artwork for me. So most of it's chose by other people. But I have my favorite pieces. Almost all the artwork is in the public domain that I deal with. So I don't have to worry about copyright. That's kind of why I chose it. That's also why I search out artists, so that I can help them and they can help me. Like everything else, you keep learning from your heirs. Usually it takes the first pieces I do, if I'm going to put it into production, I do two or three to figure out the best way I want to do the, the three dimension. And by the third one, I've kind of figured out the best way to bend the paper. But prior to that, it's just learning. The first generation, I had left the background imaging in there, which kind of hampered me into how far I could bring the images off the paper. And I'd start to distort the image, trying to get it back to that 3D on the, the first sheet. And then I decided to actually take that image off the page. And when I did that, I put a drop shadow in its place so it looked like it actually had movement in the background. And then that, that brought the imaging from half inch off the paper to anywhere from three inches or back, you know, farther off the paper. So it's evolved, but now we're at Gen 8. So I've gone through seven generations. Gen 8's probably the last one. I, that I finally have gotten the best way of producing them to where I, I really like the pieces and how they came out. Next up is a citizen journalist, an Akron ambassador, and she has one name, Yoli. Let's go see what Yoli's all about. Why is citizen journalism important to me? Um, not everyone reads the paper, not everyone watches television, and a lot of people are not connected uh, through standard broadcasting, whether it's radio or television. Citizen journalism allows me to take the stories that I find and share them with my network, everyone I know. Um, it is information that I, it's not edited, I don't edit it, I don't change anything. I just pretend, present what's happening. And it's, it's refreshing not to have that kind of censorship or to have commentary attached to that piece. It's just, look, this is what's happening now. Make your own opinions. That's, that's why it's important, not just to me, but I think it should be important to everyone. So Akron has great coverage. The difference between a major market and Akron is that Akron doesn't have to rely on a a network that is out of town doesn't have to rely on media CEOs deciding what stories are important, what stories are not important. In Akron, we kind of decide for ourselves what's important and what everybody should know. Not having a television station, it kind of helped bring the community together, together to share, which I haven't seen anywhere else. I've seen it in small pockets, in small communities, but not in a city-wide um, way, the way we do it here. I have a feeling that if we did have our own television station broadcasting right from downtown, we might not have the information that we have freely available. I don't know, maybe we would, but people get lazy. People stop, if somebody else is doing the job, they stop. <laughs> The best 
thing that you can use is what you have in your hand. You know, I, I have friends who paint with tar and paint with charcoal that, you know, they pull out of the fireplace. Not because that's what they're gonna use forever, but that's because that's what they have. And that's the same with me. I, I always have my phone. I mean, who does not leave home without a phone nowadays? Very few people. And it, it really doesn't matter the quality of your phone or how expensive it is or what, what version it is. I, I use my backup phone, my backup camera, is a, a Samsung Galaxy 5. And it does just as well as this one, which is a 9. The best thing you have is the best thing you have. Simply, simply put. Hi everyone, this is Yoli for Traveling Yo-Yo for the Devil Strip. And I am in Highland Square tonight, bringing you a company hour. So I've always volunteered. Um, I, once I got out of high school, once I got out of college, and I started raising my, my children, it was the only way I could give back. I didn't have any money. You know, I have seven kids. Money does not go very far when you have seven children. Being able to give back to your community, to your church, to your family, to your friends, when you can't pay them for the services they've rendered to you, is, it's almost like starting a savings account. You do something for them, they're more willing to do something for you. When I moved to Akron the second time in 1997, I had been living in the area for about four years and I had not heard a single word of Spanish, which, which is one of my native languages. I, I grew up speaking English and Spanish, both in the same household. And I, I hadn't heard it for four years. And I read in the newspaper that there was a, a Catholic worker house in near downtown Akron, and they were looking for interpreters. And I was like, I, I, I know how to interpret. I speak English. I could, speak Spanish, I can, I can go help. I volunteered my services as, as an interpreter, and I ended up becoming a chauffeur, a tutor, a daycare provider. Um, I went uh, with this woman to the hospital when she went into labor, and I helped her throughout the whole process because there was nobody there who could speak to her. If doing things for others just comes second nature. I wish I could get paid for it. I don't. Oh, I just, you know, I pay my own data plan and I, it's expensive by the way, <laughs> just so that I can live stream on all social media, just so that I can share all those stories, just so that I can work with different publications and put up the stories that need to be put out and present to the audience stories that need to be told. Um, I don't know, I've always done some kind of service. People have always done for me, and it's, it's my duty to do for them. Now to wrap this show up is a part one of a two-part story on Ohio Columbus Barber, better known as O.C. Barber, a kid from Akron who started the city of Barberton. Let's go see what this guy's all about. O.C. Barber, and his name was O.C. Barber, Ohio Columbus Barber, uh, was a, uh, he was a prominent citizen in the Akron area. In fact, probably Akron's leading citizen between the Civil War and maybe 1920 when he died. Uh, so uh, he, he was probably the most prominent citizen in the county and a great industrialist. In fact, uh, many people list him as the father of trusts, which is a uh, business combination which could influence the direction of a particular industry and dominate it throughout the world. Uh, and his particular trust was matches. And if you think back, way back uh, in, at the turn of the 20th century, there was no automatic pilots or anything like that. Everything had to be lit with matches. And so uh, it is said that he controlled 80% of the domestic production of matches and 20% of the world's production of matches. And he started out uh, by dropping out of school at the age of 16 
and selling matches door to door for his father's business in Middlebury, which is in Akron. That's how he got his start. Uh, eventually, uh, he came to own the business and he combined different uh, small um, homegrown match companies into this big combine, the Diamond Match Company. Well, there was a small settlement here called New Portage, okay? And it was right along the canal. Uh, O.C. Barber had his uh, diamond match operation, which was in Akron, his largest employer in Akron. And uh, there were two things going on. First of all, he thought that there might be oil and gas in this area, so he wanted to do oil and gas exploration, uh, which he bought a lot of property and it came up dry, or it, it hit deposits that were not what he was looking for. Uh, the other th other aspect was he was starting out the Diamond Rubber Company to compete with B of Goodrich and Goodyear. And uh, he tried to get them interested in a joint venture, but they didn't go for it. So he decided he's going to build his own rubber operation, tire making operation. So he wanted to take the Diamond Match Company, which he, he wanted to grow it a little bit more, so he was going to build another building for that, and he was going to move diamond rubber into where his match company was. Uh, so uh, what happened was in 1891, he came up with this idea that he's going to build a city, uh, name it after himself, which so a lot of industrials wanted to build model communities. Let's say uh, Pullman in, uh, in Chicago, outside of Chicago, Hershey's, different industrials, an ideal community uh, that, that were planned, not just happened, they were planned. So uh, he took this piece of land that he had and there's this beautiful lake in the center. And so what he does is he draws it like a floor plan of a house. He takes the section of land and he says, okay, the center of this community will be Lake Anna. It's, well, it wasn't Lake Anna, it's called Lake Davis Pond. So this beautiful lake will be in the center. This will be the industrial section. I will set up lots for the industrial section. This will be the commercial section, and this will be the residential se section. And he drew it out as a plot uh, based on the uh, uh, Western Pennsylvania plan. There were some couple of models uh, communities in Western Pennsylvania. And so he set it up for sale in 1891 brought in like seven or eight industries to employ the people in that community. And then uh, in 1893, uh, there was a panic. It was one of the worst panics in the uh, economy of the United States up until that time. And so he was worried about, there were riots in Pullman's community up in Chicago, the Pullman riots. Uh, uh, there was tremendous suffering and he was uh, very, uh, patronizing of the people that settled in Barberton. So he suspended the collection of rents. If you got behind in your rent, he didn't collect it, he let it go. And then he decided to move the matchmaking operation from Akron to Barberton to employ those people who lost their jobs in the other industries that went out of business. And so that's how this, this community came into being. There were challenges from the stockholders to move in on Barbert and take over the company. So Barbert saw that, you know, this is a good time to, for him to exit, and so he did. Uh, and, and the other thing that's coming along was the change in the uh, agricultural uh, regulations in this country. So he saw another operation, or another opportunity to make money and move into another direction. He was 68 years old and, you know, this is the thing, you know, you think about when you start stuff, you know, he, in, in my opinion, uh, his, his starting this farm, which was probably considered the world's greatest farm at the time, uh, you're never too old to start something. Okay, so he, at the age of 68, 
he starts a whole different venture. And he starts this farm and he lives, he thought he'd lived to be 100, but he only lived to be 79 and died in, uh, I think, February 4th, 1920 of pneumonia from the, from the flu pandemic. Thank you once again for watching Around Akron with Blue Green. Now, if you have any questions, comments, or want to just drop me an email, you can reach me at www.aroundakronwithbluegreen.com or you can catch me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Thank you very much and have a great day. On this episode, we're going to talk to a 3D printer. We're going to talk to a theaters 3D artist, Akron Ambassadors, and a kid from Akron who started the city of Barbary. Hey out there, Akronites, welcome. <clears throat> hey, hey, what's happening out there, Akronites? Hey out there, Akronites, thank you once again for tuning in to Around Akron with Blue Green. On this episode, I'm going to talk to a theater. I'm going to talk to a... Hey out there, Akronites, welcome once again. Next up is, a... <laughs> is someone that can't control the paper. <laughs> up his fumble fingers. <laughs> <laughs>